Jim, thanks for making time today. Derek, also thanks for popping into the call and, and, and contributing. Um, Jim, please introduce yourself to everybody. Yeah, I'm Jim Jameson. I am one of three product managers at Norco. I take care of a lot of the long travel suspension bikes, including e-bikes. I've pretty much been in most categories at Norco over the years, but um, for the last maybe 10 years or even 15, longer travel, full suspension, and um, a few hardtails, dirt jump bikes I still do. So yeah, I've been um, at Norco since 1989. I started just out of university when I was 21. So it's like 32 years ago, I think. So I'm one of the older staff at Norco, but interestingly, my boss, Dave, has been at Norco longer than me. So I've worked with him a long time. One of our other product managers just retired recently. So spent a lot of years working with Pete. And yeah, there's a few other old timers around the office as well. But um, yeah, it's been a pretty rad company. And I've worked in the bike division pretty much since early 1990. I actually started in the warehouse. Um, in the beginning, but uh, started and moved up to the office pretty quickly. Just turning my phone off here. Okay, yeah. So awesome. I well, appreciate that, um, Derek. If you could do the same, that'd be uh, amazing. My name is Derek Kidd. Uh, I've worked at Norco for about five years now. Uh, I started with our distributor brands portfolio up in Canada. I actually lived in Vancouver, BC, and worked out of the head office doing marketing for uh, for our distributor brands up in Canada. And then in 2019, I moved down to Portland and I've been doing uh, field marketing down here ever since. So I got a big fleet of bikes and I go around uh, with ambassadors, creating content and doing advocacy uh, in, in the PNW. And sometimes I get to work with awesome shops like Summit. So yeah, been around for, for five years and it's been absolutely awesome the entire time. It's a super great company to work for. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. I'll, I'll do a brief interview. Most of our audience will know who I am at this point. Uh, I'm Poncho. I do the marketing for Summit. I've worked with the company for about 10 years. Um, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, mostly I do what Ian, the owner, tells me to do. And um, yeah, er everything else in between, you know, sell bikes, write about bikes, film videos, team sponsorships, kind of everything. Um, so yeah, I, I touch a lot of parts of the business. Um, but today I'm happy to hear about what makes Norco Norco and really what sets you guys apart from the rest of the industry. And, um, you know, what a lot of consumers don't see is the special story behind all these brands that we sell. And, um, everyone's different and everyone has a different reason that, you know, makes their brands and, and products special. And, and we want to tell that story to, to our audience. Um, so I'll hop right into it. Um, what's the design ethos for Norco? Like what makes you guys Norco as opposed to any other bike company? I mean, Norco has been around since 64, so it's the same owners, same kind of background, same, I guess, history. It's it's really cool because the company's kind of had the same thought process, I guess, since day one. And the original owner, I would say, was a rider and still up till his recent passing, he was riding his bike on a regular basis. So when you talk about rider owned, I would say Norco's rider owned since 64. And really, I think he gave us a lot of freedom all the way along. Like I look back to some of the projects we did or have done over the years and we're a big enough company that we have the resources to do it right. Or, you know, I, I would say we're the biggest in Canada and we've been strong in Canada for a long time, but branching out outside of Canada was a big step. But just having the resources to be able to do cool bikes and bikes we wanted to ride but being small enough to be light on our feet that we weren't um, challenged by other stresses. We could kind of tweak things. And, and this has been going on for a long time. Like I'm thinking back to some of the first free ride bikes, dirt jump bikes, bikes we experimented with and kind of took a little bit of a leap or made a bike that worked for our terrain. And it gave us that chance to kind of step outside the box a bit. So it's still happening today where, you know, range is a good example with lots of things on that bike that are unique and different than the mainstream bike. And it often made sense just as a bike, but it also made sense in our trails and our kind of riding style and where we've evolved from. And I think that's put our bikes a little bit ahead of the competition because often the trails are more demanding or some of the trail builders are even building really progressive trails, you know, and, and that dates back a long way too. So that's given us a bit of an edge, I think, and um, given us a bit of a unique niche in a way to to just be Norco, you know? 
Yeah, no, I, I totally, I totally get that. I mean, when I first started getting into mountain biking, I mean, the Norco Shore was like one of those poster bikes, at least for me as a kid, you know, like the red and the wide monocoque frame with the monster T and the big beefy tires. Like those are the bikes that I drooled over as a kid. And I was like, man, like, you know, one day I want to ride the shore. One day I want to like ride the shore on a Norco shore, right? Like that's, <laughs> that was like the dream from like a kid from California who like the scene was here, but it wasn't, it wasn't like that. And it's, you know, the scene in California versus the scene of where you guys are is so different. And, and the bikes certainly reflect that. And, you well, know, and we it was lo- cool even it. like on that note, I remember traveling down to Australia maybe six or eight years ago to visit the distributor there. And a lot of the younger shop guys there had grown up with Norco like Kathmandu's and Bigfoot's and um, the old shore hardtails. And they were so stoked on their history with Norco. And I was thinking, wow, that's pretty cool that we've kind of pushed outside of what we thought was a local scene into these other countries and places. Like you're saying, you know, a shore was a cool bike or, or was a little different or had an edge maybe on the typical mainstream bike. But, you know, even I've talked to other, um, you know, brands and, and people that work in the industry and they're saying, oh, you know, I wish our brand could take a kid's bike like a fluid kids and just make super progressive geometry, but their corporate sort of background just won't allow that. Whereas with Norco, we were able to put a 63 and a half degree head tube angle on a fluid 20 inch with a steep seat tube and make a legitimate kid's bike that we felt made sense for riding steeper terrain or in a bike park. So little things like that, or going back years to um, short hardtails where we put 24 inch back wheels on and people like that's a risky move, but it was kind of something ahead of the competition. And, you know, we did it with a Shinobi. It was an early 29er with long travel and more aggressive angles. That bike was kind of unique for its time. And some of the earlier 650B sites that came out were kind of on the pulse there. And so even now, like I say, with range, where it's got gravity tune and that was well ahead of its kind of what's almost normal now to have different chainstay lengths for every frame size. But really that was 11 years ago we did that on our first Orem. So good history there with just some things that made sense to us and uh, now they become kind of industry standards. So. Yeah, Norco's always been kind of pushing the limit. I mean, like I said, making making those shores back in the day and, and, and the, the smaller rear wheel, you know, it was the first iteration of mullet, right? Like the 24, 26 bikes that were come out. It's like, that's standard practice now, right? Mullet bikes are, are basically commonplace in any halfway decent mountain bike shop. Um, and it, it almost kind of, sound. It's, it's cool to think about like the kids looking at the range now, like I used to look at the shore back in the day and seeing like oh well, that's what those guys up in canada are riding like they're riding that stuff on the steep slabs on the you know on the fresh dirt you know on a line like that's the bike now um and maybe we jump right into it like you know range one bike of the year with pink bike you know let's let's talk about the story there and how that how that bike came to be yeah i think i mean that was a pretty exciting bike for us in the bike division you know, I was pretty stoked when I heard that it won the bike of the year because we had won it two years ago with the Optic. And I felt like they might not give it to Norco again because it almost seemed like someone else, you know, would probably get it two years later. But I started breaking it down. And I think the range really was a unique bike in a lot of ways. And it pushed us ahead of our competitor again a little bit. And it was it was a bike that started almost as a planned enduro bike like we drew that up as we wanted to make a really good enduro ews race bike we brought out the new shore as more of a free ride kind of fun bike and everything around that range was kind of planned around just a fast ews bike that you could pedal all day do long stages but um make that bike a legitimate race bike so that was the the start of it but i think there was things that were um spawned from the geometry say from the new site that was more modern or progressive at the time maybe almost borderline a little risky when site came out there the, the latest generation um, but then it stepped even further where ride aligned the setup guide and that was getting more refined and the engineers were spending a lot more time with the shock um, makers and just dialing in the bike the shock and then that added our spec on there where we were really trying to dial in the spec that much better and more refined for that bike, not compromising where we put, you know, that same shock on all three price points. So 
that's part of it. I think then taking gravity tune a couple steps further by, you know, steepening seat tube angles on every size as the sizes went up, um, slackening head tube angles on every size. Um, so the geometry was completely different for every frame rather than just changing the rear centers and even then changing links in the bike. So the small riders link was different than the larger rider. Um, so the bikes were really sized properly for the riders. And then it just was a lot of, I guess, just trail testing and work with the engineers to refine everything. So it was kind of a slow bike to get out to market, but we were really trying to tick every box do it right. Then we got hit with the COVID thing that kind of threw a few wrenches in there. Um, but if you get a chance to watch the forged video we did, it's really kind of encompasses a lot of that behind the scenes stuff where we had test mules um, for a long time. We had early prototypes. We had the team racing a downhill version of that bike and riding it on trails as well. So yeah, lots of steps, but really in the end, we felt we brought out a rad bike. And it was kind of interesting because we were all going, wow, this bike really attacks trails well. Like you, whether you're a pro or a beginner or somewhere in between where most people ride, you just felt safer and more confident on the trail. Like you could actually ride faster, ride smoother and, and ride almost safer, whether you're trying to win an EWS or whether you're just riding. And I really had a, a rad um, kind of time there. I don't want to get too into this, but we met with a lot of media last spring and we were trying to explain this you know a good bike you can ride all day it's you know fatigue management um, but my son was racing an ews oh I, I think you hit on something really good there jj it just it makes you feel fast like you ride it and you're just like oh all right oh. yeah it's it's on even if you know me i'm not a super fast rider but i get on that thing it's like oh <laughs> well you it's, ride it's stuff you piece. might not normally ride like i i rode that dark side of the shore like a month or so ago with david and i was riding big scary rock drops and rolls and i was like i wouldn't ride on another bike so those things just give you that much you know more safety or or fun factor fast whatever it is it's like that elbows up position that you can hold through the gnarliest stuff and you can like you can transfer across the trail right in the middle of the nastiest stuff you've ridden <laughs> and you just feel safe you just feel like centered on the bike you know it's yeah you don't feel like you're in the middle of the gnarliest trail you've ever ridden, even if it is the gnarliest trail you've ever ridden. <laughs> you just feel that much more control. I absolutely love it. I, I can't wait to get my leg over a range. It sounds awesome. I love that the bike seems like it's made for everyone from like, you know, a top enduro racer to like your everyday backcountry rider who just wants to get out and get rowdy. And um, there's so many bikes out there that I've been on where it really only, it, it's for like that top, whatever 10% of riders like it's unless you're really ringing it out you know riding it at seven eight nine tenths um it feels great but if you're riding it at five tenths you know where i'd say the vast population rides at you know four to six tenths um the bike doesn't behave like it's designed to because they design it for the racers twin racers and they don't design it for like your everyday guy to just go out and have a good time and um man this one sounds super fun like what well, and super accessible bike the setup guide helped there too because we're trying to let people adjust their riding skill levels and you can mess with tire pressures you can adjust your settings we're really trying to just give the rider the best out of the bike too and i think that's something no other brand does right now is just let people or give people that help or that last tool to get their bike more dialed in yeah no we talk about that at the shop all the time and, and so much of getting the proper experience out of the bike is getting it set up properly which is you know what our staff is there to do but um you know if you if a customer takes a bike home and doesn't know where to start or doesn't know like why their ride wasn't as good as it could be and don't know where to look like it makes it tough for them to enjoy you know they just spent a ton of money on, on a brand new toy and it's like hey it's not doing what i thought it was going to do um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we put a very big emphasis on setup and, and PSI and the shock and make sure you're, if you're running a coil, it's the right spring rate and all that stuff. So yes, yeah, setup guides are key. And, and I love that companies like Norco are taking the time to, to make those resources available to every consumer, whether they have access to a bike shop, because not every one of our customers lives within 15 minutes or within a reasonable driving distance to our store. Right. So if they live an hour mm -hmm. away, they live um, in Sacramento, which is, you know, an hour and a half, two hours away from the closest shop but they, were, they couldn't find a range anywhere else. They bought it from us. They need a place to be able to go to, to turn to, to tune it. Um, For sure. 
You brought up Optic winning Bike of the Year a couple of years prior. That seems like a really, talking about accessible bikes, very friendly bike for everyone to ride and to take advantage of. Um, let's chat about that for a bit. Why do you think it's, so, it's reached such a broad spectrum of, of riders out there? Yeah, it's funny because that was our generation two of Optic. And Gen 1, I think, was toned down. It was more of a, a safe kind of bike. It wasn't an XC race bike. It was a light trail bike. But that bike didn't sell that well. And I think we almost discontinued Optic because we had a revolver, we had a sight, and they were both doing quite well. But the Optic was stuck in the middle. But I think it gave us some free reign to almost have fun with that bike. And actually, our other product manager, Paul, worked on that. But we all looked at the geometry updates and we went, that's rad. But then he's like, well, we're going to spec a DH shock on it with a piggyback, like the Super Deluxe DH. We're going to put four piston brakes and big tires. And we're going to make a fun, rowdy, short travel bike. And we were stoked because I think it brought back that fun of riding like in Bellingham where you can rip jump trails. They're not super rough and big, gnarly mountain trails but they got big jumps, they got good flow, but you can ride a smaller bike and have a rowdier time and feel like you're on a big bike. So it was a big bike in a few ways where the parts that kind of lined up, but it was a small bike in travel and it had new school angles. And I think it beat a lot of the competition to the mark there too, because there wasn't a lot of options. Usually when you talk 125 mil rear travel, your borderline XC race so that bike was quite different. And then the Bryn video with that bike ripping corners and blasting through trails really hit the mark too with a lot of riders. And I think they went, wow, this is fun. And I think that's why Pink Bike picked up on that too. And I remember Mike Casimir after going, I want to buy this bike off you guys. I feel like that kind of built off a lot of the success from the 2017 to 2019 site as well, which was just such an easy bike to hop on and feel like a rock star. Like you could just, if you got the right size, you set it up, hit the trails and just felt fast right away. It was like the right travel range. Uh, the 29er was crazy fast. And then I think a lot of the winning properties of that model transferred over to the optic and just got modernized with a little nicer geometry a little bit more stability maybe and uh yeah so it was just it, it made the optic that bike that you could just throw a leg over and feel like you knew what you were doing on a bike you felt like brim as soon as you start riding it <laughs> it's a real good feeling yeah it's funny you brought up that the four cross bike um i'll date myself here i i started working on a shop way back um early in college and the, the fun bikes then were um whatever, the Blur 4 Cross and the, um, the Specialized SX, I think it was. Yeah, um, the SX Trail. That was the same kind of bike. Yeah, totally. And uh, we, my friends and I, we all thought, man, like these, these bikes are awesome to ride. They're fun to rip on, shred corners, do dirt jumps. But man, they suck to like get up to the top of the hill. And so we'd bring them out to the trail, but like we'd start walking them. I think this resurgence of fun, rowdy, short travel bikes is like the polished version of that right like the, the optic is the pedal friendly version of four cross bike from, from back in the day which has given people the the willingness and and, and want to shred corners and, and do jumps and drops and stuff like that and ride like that that brain video which we watch almost every day in the shop by the way <laughs> that's um, rad yeah it's yeah, no, uh, that's that was a good era with those kind of bikes for sure yeah no it's it's nice to see that like lively fun eat like design language come through um in the optic and um, that's one of the bikes i'm excited to get in the shop for sure like range and optic i think are going to be just you know knockouts uh, with, with our customers for sure that's also a real nice bike combo to have as, as a as a quiver you know you got your short travel <laughs> you can pedal forever super playful for like those tight little trails for the dirt jumps and that kind of thing and then you've got your absolute smasher bike that you can take that you know you don't have to be scared of anything on the range. Yeah, it's pretty much you can go bike park riding or even I know right now there's a girl in Australia winning um, downhills on her range with a Zeb fork on it. And I think she just won the Australian woman's like pro like pro title or whatever last weekend. And anyway, she's just I mean, it's a capable bike. So it's it's almost a mini downhill bike in that sense. Yeah. I'll jump back into range real quick. Um, the, the high pivot thing seems to be a pretty constant topic in the shop from customers. Like, we'll come in, they'll see a high pivot bike, they'll be like, "Hey, like, what is that? Is that an e-bike? Like, why why does it look the way it looks? Can you explain?" 
Um, why, why do you think the high pivot has come back as a, a trend or, you know, a technology in bikes now? What's uh, what's causing that? Uh, I think that people understand rearward axle path and it makes sense to have more rearward axle path. Um, and then you don't want that chain feedback or the pedal kick. Um, it just removes that out of the equation so you can basically have as much rearward axle path as you need or how the kinematics you want to achieve to optimize the shock and the rear wheel moving over bumps fast it just takes that chain issue of, of a pedal kickback out of the equation because we've we've had bikes with quite a bit of pedal kickback in the past where we've tried to get rearward axle path to make the bike better on bumps but people were having issues with sort of getting kicked around on the pedals. And that was that whole thing where Aaron Gwynn won chainless years ago because he sort of broke his chain and then his cranks were free, his suspension was free. There was no interruption there. And I think, I mean, it's been around forever, but I think it was, it might've been six or eight years ago, our team was experimenting on an early Orem. They added an idler wheel to the standard four bar, our older, I forget what generation, maybe generation two Orem. So they built some prototypes of that, and then that spawned our Orem HSP, which was a high single pivot to, again, almost eliminate that axle or add axle path, but eliminate that pedal kickback. And that was where we started dialing that in better, and our engineers were realizing and our riders were loving it. So it made perfect sense on these long travel bikes. So other than how it maybe looks to some people, it looks a little different, um, you know, it looks more complicated, but the benefits outweigh that when you start to ride it and feel how well it works. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the high pivot bikes. Uh, I've ridden a few and they, they ride awesome. The setting capabilities are out of this world. I think once people start to, to spend more time with them and, and to use them and to ride them, that it's, you know, it's undeniable, like you said. Um, so that being said, do you think Norco is going to do more high pivot bikes? I mean, do you guys have one of the pipeline and is there a limit to like, how much travel a bike should have with a high pivot? Like, will we see a high pivot optic? I mean, is it just going to be in the Enduro World Series category of the, the bikes like range? Um, how far will it go or not go? Yeah, good question. I think right now we're just testing. We're not sure. We know it makes sense for longer travel bikes, but we're not ready to commit yet on sight and optic, but we're definitely interested to learn more on those bikes. But again, I mean, how much better or different that's what we got to figure out on the shorter travel um but we're working on some new stuff and our engineers are kind of deep into it now so you'll see some stuff coming um just can't say if it's high pivot yet moving into the short travel stuff well sweet man we're, we're super excited to see it um i guess we'll shift gears here a little bit so to speak and um talk about your e-bikes uh e-bikes are obviously undeniable uh big category in, in the cycling industry in general um I, I know we at summit are selling more e-bikes than we ever had and just going to the local trails i see <laughs> i see more e-bikes than acoustic bikes these days um which is interesting um good or bad however you want to spin it um but side vlt and range vlt are you know i've arrived at the shop and um, i picked up a, a range vlt and i've had a, uh, maybe a handful of rides on it now, and it's pretty awesome. So I have a couple of questions. Why did Range VLT not get a high pivot? And then for the customer but for who's deciding between Sight and, and Range VLT, how, do, how should they differentiate? How should they look at both bikes to, to pick one that suits them the best? I think on the high pivot thing, I think we're interested to learn again more on the e-bike side. Um, we're experimenting with that now to try it and see if it's going to work and make sense. Um, not to say we'll do it or not do it, but, um, looking into it for sure. Um, I think it makes sense on an e-bike, no different than on a pedal bike. Um, but again, it just, there's more going on with an e-bike. So more learning, more testing. Um, and it's got to make it better, right? If it, if it doesn't make anything better, what's the point? Yep. Mm -hmm. Like high bike did it years ago. Um, they had a high pivot, but they abandoned that shortly after. So I'm not sure why, but uh, yeah, definitely interesting. Um, as far as the differences between sight and range on the e-bike side, I mean, both are quite capable. And I think often people will up travel on an e-bike. So we're seeing people ride ranges where maybe you wouldn't ride a range pedal bike because you can, you've got that assistance and why not up travel if you have that option. But 
really, I, I could say some areas where people live or some styles of riders, they don't maybe need a range. Like, you know, maybe it's the geometry being a little more aggressive, a little heavier part spec, um, you know, coil versus air, bigger fork, Zeb versus Lyric. Like, do you need that? If you feel you do, then go range and, and don't apologize. It makes sense. But if you feel like you're looking more at that trail into all mountain category and you just want to almost like a, a do it all trail bike, then hit down the middle with the site again. And that's what I always say on the pedal side, but I think it would be the same on the e-bike side. And you know, who knows, like someone who rides aggressive trails, but doesn't want the weight, they might put a 500 or 540 watt battery in a range. Whereas the other guy might put a 900 watt or other girl might put a 900 watt in a, a fluid or a site because they want to do lots of laps and have that kind of almost safety stock of battery power. But honestly, locally, I would say riders here are gravitating to range with big batteries. And maybe that's just the nature of steeper mountains here. And um, they want to get in laps. They want to make sure their battery's not going to run out. And the range is actually not much different in weight than a site. So you can get away with that and have a little more aggressive geometry. So I don't think there's one clear answer. And I think we struggle even on the pedal side. What's the right bike, optic, site, or range? You can kind of ride all the same trails in all of them. But maybe one excels better in one thing. Maybe you want to overbike a little bit and be safe for the trails you ride that are the most aggressive. And yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a hard one. Personally, I, I ride the site as my acoustic. I ride it for pretty much everything. You know, I, I got a range. Uh, I've even got an HSP and I still take the site absolutely everywhere I can because I'm used to it. And you know, that platform that I've spent so much time <laughs> building muscle memory around this bike, to step into the site VLT, you know, at, at, at trail speed, they feel remarkably similar. So I feel like I can throw a leg over that bike and, you know, attack the same trails in the same way. There's not, there's not necessarily like a learning curve to it as much as I would have thought. So I really like the site VLT just because it feels like, you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's a, a much faster uphill version of my regular site. And I could jump it the same and I could smash into corners the same and everything feels really familiar. And I really like that going, uh, going back and forth between the bikes. Yeah, that 150 travel bike is, is a pretty happy, happy medium for, for kind of going anywhere or do anything. We, we tell that to our customers as well because there's a lot of that discussion happening, you know, on a daily basis um, on the shop floor. It's like, hey, well, what should I do? And you know, the, the trails close by, like in San Jose or in Santa Cruz, um, you can, like you said, you can ride whatever bike you want, whether it's an optic or, or a site or a range. It kind of depends on the experience you want. Um, you know, that whole notion of having the big travel bike with the big battery is kind of the, the way I went, I think, like for e-bikes. I mean, that's, that's the best way to go, at least in my opinion. Obviously, like what fits me doesn't fit everybody else for sure. Um, but having the ability to do laps and laps and laps all day long and, just get a ton of descending feet in. It's like, that's awesome. Like you can't shake a stick at that. There's no like hating on an e-bike for, for doing, for doing descending laps. And I'm, I'm a huge fan. Like when you guys were like, yeah, nine hundred watt battery, 170 mil travel. And I was like, sign me up. Absolutely. That's the way to do it. But uh, were there any other bits and pieces that you want consumers to know about Norco that, you know, maybe, maybe are stories that are hidden don't get told that often. Um, you know, kind of what's it like to work there? Um, and you know what the culture is in the company yeah no that's a good one i mean the culture is pretty awesome i would say i mean like being at norco for so many years i think it's changed a bit i think there's lots of new younger energy our bike division is growing a lot with um a lot of younger engineering talent um yeah we just hired kirk mcdowell he's a pro downhill racer as one of our engineers he just graduated from engineering school so he's joined the team but I think really the development timelines have taken longer now because we have a bigger team and we're doing a lot more, we're getting more deeper into the bikes and, and into the small details than maybe in the past. But yeah, culture, um, as far as being a cool company to work for, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's uh, in a good place, you know, we're right beside some of the awesome riding and mountains. So that's helped, you know, we have a, a mountain, about 10 minutes from the office burke mountain which is super steep and pretty rowdy oh that's my favorite <laughs> so, yeah, that's, so janky all the time <laughs> it's just a good kind of test bed like when i i look at where we you know go for a lunch lap or whatever it's 
pretty rowdy, but it's, it's right beside the office and then just being close to the shore and, um, even close to Whistler. And I live pretty close to Bellingham, just on the border. So I'm down in Bellingham quite a lot. I haven't been down there in a while with the border being shut down, but that's a great place too. But yeah, no, I think Norco, it's just good people and um, the chance to build cool bikes and uh, be part of that has been awesome. You know, I, I rode a Norco BMX when I was a kid and raced that when I was probably 11 or 12 up to maybe 14. So kind of grew up with the Norco brand as a kid and uh, moved into mostly mountain biking after that. But uh, now actually two of my kids race on the Norco team, which is kind of cool. One on the factory team and one on a grassroots kind of cross country team that's local here. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a cool kind of family feeling I'd say. So that's I got my first Norco in 1999. My first ever bike was a Norco Kathmandu. <laughs> Badass. And uh, yeah, just used to rip around the block and yeah, wheelie drop off stairs and all that kind of stuff. And then a couple years later, I started discovering mountain biking and I was on, living on Vancouver Island at the time. And I remember we used to do, uh, or you guys used to do Rad Fest up at Mount Washington every year. And I remember yeah. going to the first one of those with a Norco. I think I had a 250 at that time, like a dirt jump bike, yeah, nice. travel four, like burly tires. And I was riding this uh, super rocky mountain resort. And I just remember the culture around Norco. You got, you know, you had a you had a party afterwards. Like everybody was invited. It was just like the coolest scene. Like this crew that was clearly a family. They all knew each other really well. Everyone was rousing each other. Um, you know, people would go out for laps halfway through the day and would just take, you know, average Joes like me out for a lap of the mountain. And uh, I got to ride my first Norco six, which I just absolutely fell in love with. And uh, yeah, when I when I joined the company in 2016, um, that was like, yeah, you really got a feel for that family atmosphere, especially in the HQ. Like it's a pretty big building, it's got a whole lot of people, but it's still, you know, you feel like you're among friends and family all the time. And that's one thing I miss moving down here, and you know, I can only talk to my friends over over Zoom or over Teams. I just miss that, like hanging out in the office dodging all the Nerf gun darts coming from the HQ <laughs> department. And uh, yeah, it was, it's a really, really good time for the HQ. It's very cool. Yeah. There's a good culture. If you get a chance to get up here sometime, you can take a tour of the office and go for a ride. Or if you're around Vancouver, that'd be awesome. I will, Don't. I will take any excuse to go up there and go ride bikes. So if you dangle that carrot in front of me, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm, I'll take you guys up on it for sure. I'll bring some guys up and we'll, we'll do a tour and do a ride. I'm, we're super down for that. Don't let JJ take you to Burke Mountain. <laughs> Just oh. say no. It's oh JJ, that climb, man, that climb is brutal. The climb's pretty hard, but it's worthy. Uh, there's some there's some good views and there's some good descents, but man, that's a rugged mountain. <laughs> Sounds like we'll do e-bikes then if the, if the climb's gonna be that bad. I'm 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 no good climber. Um I never have and I don't think I ever will be, but um yeah, no, I'm down for the descent. Let's let's make it happen. The sense fun. Yeah, yeah, no, if you're up this way, yeah, I'd be stoked to come stop by your store too. Which which town or do you have several stores? Yeah, we have five shops. Um, so I usually spend most of my time in the Los Gatos store, which is the, the furthest south, uh, obviously closest to the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, so if you ever like make it out this way or go to Sea Otter, like I'm happy to show you around or um, cool. have you by the shop, grab lunch, do whatever for sure. Thanks. Yeah, sounds good. We're coming down to Sea Otter for a couple of days, but it's going to be a pretty quick trip. It sounds like we're only there Friday, Saturday. So, oh bummer! I'll, I'll just miss you. Um, I'm I'm going to show up on Sunday, and uh, uh, we might be there Sunday morning. I think we fly out Sunday afternoon, so we'll see. Maybe we'll uh, meet up. Yeah, there. I try to try to get there early as I can for sure. I get yeah, your flight, JJ. What's that? <laughs> you <like> <laughs> I know it sounded like Paul and Rachel had to get back, so I was like, I'll just go with the plan. But yeah, no, that's a rad area. I haven't ridden around there too much, um, but I've gone surfing in Santa Cruz and pretty awesome spot. Yeah, we're, we're lucky. It's, it's the goods, JJ. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's some really, really cool stuff around Santa Cruz. I get jealous watching all the videos of mountain biking up in, in Canada, up in Vancouver and in Squamish and you know, all the good places you guys have up north. Obviously Whistler, but uh, yeah, I mean our town's pretty good. We we got some trails out here. Happy to show them to you. Cool. 
Sounds good. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, hopefully we kind of covered most of what you. Yeah, had. no, that's everything for me. I mean, you, you guys are super thorough. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks again for, for squeezing me in and doing this, uh, this interview. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Hopefully Norco goes well for you guys and um, reach out if you have questions and things. Like I say, we're often more able to take feedback and listen, you know, if there's issues with spec or there's questions on why we did something, um, we're not like the big guy that we're too big to listen. You know, I think that's what makes Norco cool because we've really helped distributors and, and shops along the way where we've worked together to make better bikes. So we're not really um, here to tell you what we're doing. We're here to work together and just um, make better bikes together. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're happy to give feedback whenever um, you know people want to listen. Um, we hear a lot from our consumers or they're, they're very vocal about what they want and what they think works well. And, I'm more happy to communicate that whenever we can. Um, the only, my only ask is that that 20 inch fluid you're talking about with the slack head angle and and steep C tube angle. My I got a five year old who likes mountain bike, and I'm like, man, I got to get him one of those things. And if and to boot, JJ and I were talking about that. Um, I have a dealer that is willing to put an e motor on it because I'm still waiting for a 20 inch motor because Stasic doesn't make one in Mondraker's out and and so I'm like, well, I wonder how much that thing would weigh. But um, I, I'm debating on pulling the trigger, Poncho, and uh, seeing how it runs. <laughs> yeah, let me know how that works out for sure. I'm, I'm, I don't know if I want to give him a motor just yet. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil spoil the sauce <laughs> this early, but. Um, well, he yeah. has two bikes. It's not your one bike quiver killer. You have two. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Uh, but yeah, that fluid twenty man looks awesome, and I, I want to get I want to get my kids on that as soon as I can for sure. I just gotta get Adrian to dig one up for me. Yeah, well, you know it's interesting because I have a daughter. She's eight now, but she did the last summer bike park, um, almost like a kids camp up there for three or four days on the fluid and I just look at how safe again and easy it was for her to ride stuff because the bike, you weren't going over the bars. You were kind of comfortable in the riding position, climbing, descending, like it's no different than an adult sitting in a more steep seat tube, longer front center position with a slacker head tube. It's, it looks almost scary. Like if you ride it on the road because it's pretty aggressive, but man, it's, it's definitely a help for a kid to build skills on a bike. And so I really felt like she just excelled so fast on that little bike, you know, in, in that bike park setting over a week. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think, I think you guys are on something there and like putting kids in a similar position to what the adults are doing and then giving them the same type of tools that, that let them do the, you know, the harder trails and the bigger bumps and the faster speeds. Like that all makes a ton of sense to me. Yeah, no, we're, uh, we're stoked and I think we're working on some new hardtails too that'll be coming out. Um, just kind of adding to that that kids lineup of more um, more dialed kids bikes, more premium, um, just good geometry and that. So yeah, kids bikes gr lineups growing. <laughs> yeah, it's a niche market and not a lot of people are, are catering to it. So it's nice to see that you guys are putting forth effort and, and resources to, to helping the kids you know get on decent bikes that you know are, are capable like that. Um, we're, we're super stoked. We would definitely want to support that. Yeah, and who knows about the e-bike thing for kids? I mean, I always wondered, like, if you could just make almost like a power drill style battery and a little motor in there for kids in the future. But I don't know. Like you say, you may not want them to get on e-bikes too quick, but um, there's some sense to that at some point where you can make a price point kids e-bike. True, but if, if like me, you want to go out on long rides, that's about your only choice if you're going to do something longer than six miles, right? A five-year-old can only get so far True. and uh, do it so fast. <laughs> so selfish <yeah>. reasons. <laughs> well, I know Paul, and actually I saw a guy on the trails on the weekend up in Squamish. He had two kids on ropes behind him with his e-bike, and then he was towing one. Of, like they're both kind of like those towy things, but he had two of them running with two kids. I was like, oh man, that's creative for sure. I, I gotta, I gotta try that. <laughs> yeah. So if you have two kids and you want to get them up to the top anyway, I guess that's an option with the 900 watt <laughs> range. Use it for something. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time again, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll cut it here. Um, and, um, we'll get this out to our customer base as soon as we can. Um, it was super helpful, very yeah. insightful to, to, to do this chat. Um, thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Nice to meet you, and uh, maybe we'll see you at Sea Otter. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. Hopefully we run into each other then. Um, Derek, thanks for your time, Adrian. Also, thanks for making this happen. We, 
We, uh, Thank you, Panto. Can't do it without you. Great <laughs> talking uh, to you. We'll talk, see you guys. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Cheers, Thanks guys. Yeah.